Hello and welcome to a brand new Arsblog Arscast, right here on Arsblog.com. How are you? That's a serious question this week. I know I say it at the start of every episode. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you for being here, etc. But I'm actually sort of serious in this one because, well, the transfer window opened on Wednesday. And I've got a Twitter timeline that's been fairly well cultivated to avoid, if that's the right way of putting it, a lot of the madness that exists on social media, because frankly, who has the time or the energy for all of that? Nevertheless, some of it seeps into your awareness. And I get the sense that despite the fact that the transfer window only opened on Wednesday, people are losing their absolute shit already. There was a lot of reaction when our interest in Chelsea's Kai Havertz became known uh, more widely. There was some uh, reaction to that. And today, Thursday, there was a story about Declan Rice. Yes, that guy. And it turns out we've made a bid, which West Ham have rejected, and lots of people have gone bananas. Because we didn't just pay what West Ham wanted. We should just give them everything that they want in one go, rather than, I don't know, negotiate a little bit. Apparently now... Manchester City are interested, I guess. By the time I've finished recording this bit of the podcast, Manchester United will be interested, Chelsea will be interested, Liverpool will be interested, PSG, Real Madrid, Barcelona, FC fucking fuckhead. And no, that is not a code name for Tottenham. I just couldn't think of any more football teams. It does work in that regard, though. But it's kind of exhausting. It is kind of exhausting already. And we've got a full summer of this to go. So when I ask, how are you? I hope you're all right. And I know many of you out there listening to this will be able to take some distance from the madness that is the transfer market. Actually, I should say that again, even though the transfer market is mad, what's madder is the non-stop coverage of the transfer market on TV, radio, Uh, internet, social media, all the rest of it. And I say that as somebody who is part of it. I do get it, which is why as much as possible, we try and filter the stuff that we bring you on Arsblog and Arsblog News so we're not dealing with the minutiae of, well, just some shit that some bloke made up. Um, I mean, isn't it normal for a football club to reject the first bid that they receive for a player? Unless it's something ludicrous that comes in, you're always going to say, well, no. And you're going to go back and forward a bit until you find the valuation, whether it's a £10 million player or a £100 million player. That's just kind of how it works. So, you know, I'm not ready to uh, to panic just yet. Less than 48 hours into the uh, transfer window. I might just sit back a bit and wait and see how it all pans out. The fixtures for the new season are out. They were released on Thursday morning. Some very interesting ones there. Again, without maybe getting ahead of ourselves too much because, you know, it's uh, still a good way off the start of the new season. But uh, we begin we begin at home against Nottingham Forest. We owe them one. Our first away game of the season again is at uh, Selhurst Park against Crystal Palace. We've got Manchester United and Tottenham in September. That seems good to me. I I associate beating them at home with nice, warm, sunny days. Uh, So hopefully we can do a bit of that. First time we play Man City is on October the 7th. There's an international break. Then we come back and we play Chelsea. And then, of course, you look towards the end of the season and you're thinking, well, what's the run in like? There are some tricky games. There are always tricky games. But uh, I don't know, winning the league at White Hart Lane again at the end of April. That sounds good. And if not, there's always Everton at home on the final day. How about that? So look, fixtures and transfers, it's all ahead of us. But I did say last week that I did want to do a few different bits and pieces with the Arsecast because, you know, it's too soon to just get sucked into the the maelstrom of of the summer and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, when something big happens or doesn't happen, we will talk about it and we will cover it for you. Don't worry about that. But until such time as things do or don't happen, let's take a step back and see if we can have some interesting conversations with people. And today, I'm talking to a man whose voice you will have heard, whether you've been to a game at the Emirates Stadium or not. 
He is, among other things, the Arsenal stadium announcer. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the Arscast, Peter Majuzzi. Hi, Peter. Hello, Andrew. Thank you for having me on. Uh, hello to all the listeners. I uh, hope you guys are all good and well. Yeah, it's uh, the start of summer and transfer window is, has just opened this week. And look, as far as I can tell, everyone is, is completely calm and rational and nobody's losing their shit over anything at all. So that's good, right? Which which team do you support then? <laughs> what, what set of fan bases are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, maybe I just haven't been outside enough or maybe I've been outside too much and not online enough. Maybe that's maybe that's the problem. Uh, hey, look, it's... It's, it's a long summer ahead of us, and um, I'm sure we'll we'll get pulled from pillar to post when Absolutely. it comes to uh, to transfers and all the rest of it. But why I've got you on here today is to try and have a conversation that will be of interest to Arsenal fans, but isn't necessarily about which player we're going to sign and which player everyone hates the fact that we might be signing. So uh, you have a you have a very uh, special job, I would say, at Arsenal. But before we get into that. Let's um let's go into the background a little bit. You've obviously grown up a, an Arsenal fan. What sparked your love of this this wonderful club? Yeah, well, so I got to give it out to my dad. He took me to my first ever game uh, at Highbury back in 97 98 season. So winning the double when you're 8 years old is always a great start. And, sure. <laughs> uh, uh we we played against Barnsley and I remember um just staring at Burkamp and Ian Wright, asking my dad, who's this, who's that? And then I fell in love more so with Burkamp than anything else. It was like a Burkamp love fest. And mm. then it was like, okay, now, I, now I'm engrossed in it. I'm, I'm all over it. And yeah, I just sort of supported Arsenal ever since then. So I've been a, an Arsenal fan since I was seven, eight years old. It's a, it's a good time to start your, your Arsenal uh, supporting life, isn't it? You know, winning the double 97, 98. And I know it a bit of a fallow period in, in the years, but we were competitive in that big rivalry against, against Manchester United. And then of course, doubles and invincible seasons. I mean, what, what do you remember of those? I know going back a few years, obviously, and, uh, and trying to remember when you were a kid, but yeah. I, I'm sort of curious as to how that has informed your, your Arsenal supporting life. Cause like, I've always, I always tell the story, like 1979, the FA Cup final was the first game I remember. And it was like, oh, my God, we've won the FA Cup. And the next season, we lost the FA Cup to West Ham, who are a second division team. Yeah. And then we also yeah. lost the Cup Winners' Cup to Valencia. And I feel like going from that high, I guess, and then to the low of, of realizing that you can actually lose finals yeah. gives you some kind of grounding in the ups and downs that football can give you. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, after the double in 98, imagine my first lesson as a nine-year-old to watch United win the treble. That's <laughs> never going to be something that I'll ever forget or forgive, you know. And and that's, the you know, unpopular to most belief, but I actually hate them more than I hate everybody else. So my big rivalry is Man United. But um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, in terms of like games, of course, going to Highbury to see that Barnsley fixture. But then also, I think I remember the ninth, the sort of the FA Cup final, mm. uh, you know, over miles against Newcastle. And even like the, you know, when Tony Adams scores the winner against Everton or, you know, the fourth, third and fourth goal. Like it, it was those moments where I thought, oh, this is this is what happens forever. Like this is what we do every mm. every year. And you know, being such a young kid, you know, arson and arsenal. And it was like, wait, is there something like, is this meant to be like, this, is this how it runs? Is, there, is, is that why we called him, why we're called Arsenal? Is it because of the manager? Like it was just little silly things like mm. that. But yeah, 99 got me into that, to that, to that place very, very quickly. And then of course, not winning the league for like another two years. And then eventually getting over the line with the double in 2002 it was very much like, I see that this is how football goes, kind of up and down. It's not quite linear. So yeah, so very early on, early on, I would say, yeah, you know, I've I've got the best and I've got kind of the worst in kind of the same sure. time frame. So, did you ever envisage at that point in your young life that you might work at Arsenal one day? Was it an ambition? What was what was your thing like when you were a teenager? When you were kind of figuring out what am I going to do with my life? What was yeah. what was your thing? So, like, I've always wanted to be a footballer. Like, who doesn't? Oh, yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah, we've all done Obviously, it <laughs> wasn't good enough by any stretch. And so, I remember, like, when it came to sort of education, I wasn't really a big fan of it. I didn't really, like, like school and stuff like that in terms of just the whole education, revision, exams, all that nonsense. Mm. And um, But I thought, you know, if I'm, my mom always encouraged me to sort of do something that you think you'll be very passionate about doing, make sure it's, you know, academic of some description. So, I, I got into sports journalism as a, as a in, in uni. I did mm. that at university and with the idea and the hope that maybe one day I could talk about Arsenal or write about Arsenal or something like that. Um, 
going back further though, I remember standing outside the box office, just outside like Highbury House, and seeing like there's a guy who sat there sort of selling tickets. I didn't really think working at Arsenal was a thing. Like, didn't think that even exists, unless you're a player. Mm. Um, but I remember just seeing somebody in the window, sort of like doing the box office type of thing. I thought, man, that must be a cool job. Like, I, one day I want to do that. And that was like probably when I was about, let's say. I want to say at least 16, 17 years old. Mm. I thought that maybe it might be a thing. But then, yeah, so kind of fast forward, went into uni. And then um, all I ever did was kind of part of my uni course, I used to go to the under 23s, uh, under 21s at the time at Boreham Wood and watch the Arsenal games there, match report there, that kind of thing. So it was part of my sort of my courses was Mm. to report and talk about Arsenal, which was always going to be fun. Yeah, I mean, it beats working. I can tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, from there, were you were you sort of thinking, okay, I can, I don't know, you know, what year that was, how prevalent podcasts were. I know blogging was a big thing and Arsenal blogs at the time were, yeah. uh, what, 10 a penny. You know, there were so many of them back in the day, which is, which yeah. is amazing. Um, it was just so much choice for everybody. Was that something you thought you might do or do the realities of sort of life and work push you in a slightly different direction because you got to get out there in the world and earn your crust and pay the bills and all the rest. Yeah, no, you, you're kind of caught in between the two, isn't it? So like mm. I was, I remember like sort of hearing, you know, Arsenal blogs and even podcasting. So you're, you're talking around 2012, 2013 kind of time. And, you know, it was quite heavy. It was quite Arsenal dense. There was a lot to listen to. And I used to binge it all thinking like, you know, one day I want to probably do something like this, but in order to make some money, you also got to get a job. So like, you know, mm. I had like a part-time sort of thing whilst I was at uni at the same time. Um, and, you know, nobody else knows this, but I used to work at Chelsea before I went to Arsenal. <sighs> so when I was at, yeah, when I was at uni, I did, I worked in the mega store at Chelsea for about a season. It was the year after they won the, the Champions League in 2012. Did you so print all the names on the back of the shirt wrong? So instead of Zola, it would be like Zol. Absolutely, absolutely exactly there's a reason why i've left that place so <laughs> but uh yeah so yeah you, you know shirt mm. printing and all that kind of stuff all that kind of gimmick was was really what it was and um but being at a premier league club even in in a retail capacity it kind of still made me feel like wow i'm part of like football to some mm. long distant degree and it was it's something that i always want to be involved in so i knew that i always wanted to get into football i, I didn't care how so whether mm. it was going to be via sports journalism, whether it was going to be, it, God knows, like even to where I'm, what I'm doing now, never in a million years would I have thought this was possible. But I just tried to jump onto it as much as I could. So when did you make the uh, transfer from from Chelsea to to Arsenal, and and what 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 capacity was that in? So, um, so I, it must have been the year we moved to Puma. When Arsenal joined Puma, they were like revamping their mega store. Mm. I think they would sort of redone the whole mega store, and they were kind of recruiting for like the same thing as at Chelsea. So I was like, hey, let's have a look. You know, I'll just stab in the dark. I'll send the CV through, see what happens, whatever. And yeah, straight away they were like, yeah, we need to get a lot of employees um, because of this new this new mega store. It's going to be huge and everything else. So. I kind of went in there for like an induction, really. And before I knew it, I was already working there kind of mm. thing. It was like we had like one sort of induction in, in the stadium. You get you go through the box levels kind of part of the stadium and then you're sort of just like taken aback by it. And then, um, yeah, before you knew it, it was the Emirates Cup. And it was like, yeah, everyone's starting. And it was like a, a good hundred of 20 of us that were starting first day at the at the Emirates Cup, which was, i tell you what, it was it was a hundred mile an hour. Yeah. So that would have been the summer of 20, that would have been 2014. So 2014, 2015 season. Wow. Thrown in at the deep yeah. end, I guess. Straight in. Yeah, yeah straight yeah, in. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's no, well, there are perhaps better ways to learn, but it is still a, yeah. a good learning experience. So that's 2014. At what point do you start getting involved with the match day stuff? And, and you know, as somebody who has a background in radio, I've got background in DJing and all that kind of stuff. It's it's always been a real passion of mine to get behind a microphone, you know, hence the fact that this podcast started in 2006, I think before people even knew what, what a podcast was, you know, the idea that you could sit there and you could just talk and people would listen is, is, is unreal. 
um, and it sort of scratches that particular itch. Was this something that you had always wanted to do? You said you you were doing sports journalism. Were you sort of thinking about uh, reporting, sports reporting, like one of the guys at the games for Sky, that kind of thing? Was that something that was in your mind? Um, yeah. And what sort of background did you have to that, if any, when you started doing this at Arsenal? Yeah, so so in terms of like wanting to talk about Arsenal, absolutely. In terms of like the whole sports kind of broadcasting thing, you know, it's something I absolutely have always wanted to do. It's just a, it, like me and my friends, we will always talk about football. We'll always talk about Arsenal. And, and, you know, if we could just hit record and just begin recording it and then just sort of clipping it. Mm. That would be, and if that could be a job, my goodness, of course. Yeah, that's that is definitely the number one, one of the number one things I'd love to do. Um, and so, yeah, I've always had that interest growing, you know, from from sort of uni onwards, because you, once you're in uni, you sort of learn what you like and what you don't like about the sports journalism world. And I, I, I started to realize I wasn't a fan of like the writing, match reporting, that kind of thing. Mm. But I'd love to talk about it, I'd, you know, so it'd be the easier way out. And I remember there was this one time they made us do a piece where you know, like match of the day, they kind of have like a, not even match of the day, let's say like the BBC News, they're, they're sort of showing quick highlights of Arsenal winning the double and you would you would sort of narrate over that kind of little piece, which was very short. They made us do one of those. Right. And it was very, very difficult, very, very challenging, but it was really, really fun to do. And I remember thinking like, yeah, maybe that kind of commentating sort of thing might be something I'd like, but I kind of played with it all, all around. And before I was working at Arsenal, I had started a podcast as well. It was more like a generic Premier League football mm-hmm. podcast type of thing uh, where different people supported different clubs. And I just represented it as an Arsenal fan. Um, so I've always been wanting to do that and always been, that's always been like a passion of mine. And, and my brothers and my family, they, they still do it. My friends still do it to this day. So it's one of those where I always like love the fact that we started it back in 20, I want to say 13 now. So right. it was around that time, like, you know, when it was really hot to do sure. podcasting. And then um, in terms of the experience, the only real thing in terms of like, let's say, because I DJ as well, like as a side gig. And um, I used to work at a radio station called Rinse FM. And what I was doing there was more or less like the engineer, sort of the sound engineering, they called it. Like sure. It was just literally back to back down a few tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, make sure the levels sound good for when it went out to radio. So when I was in the store in the armory, a job position came up um, on like Arsenal's kind of intranet type of thing, sort of like on the backboard. And it was basically like uh, an assistant to the announcer. And what it kind of required was things like level checks, make sure you're able to, you know, so it's like you've got your mic now. I would make sure that your levels were real right. I was making sure that, you know, we're hearing from the director, from the TV gallery, this is what you're meant to say next. And here's what's happening and substitutions, goal scorers, just kind of that kind of thing, just to sort of, Paul Burrell, as you know, who was the sure. main announcer, he's, he's, he's still the voice of Arsenal, in my opinion. 30 years plus, he's done this. Um, so I was his assistant and got to do that on the match days only as an assistant to Paul. And I'd been doing that since 2015, the 15-16 season. Um, and that would have been... So I remember my first game, funny enough, was Dynamo Zagreb in the Champions League group stage. It was in mm. December time. And then we played Spurs the next, sort of the next weekend. Okay. And so that was my first couple of games straight into that as the assistant to the to the announcer what was your initial impression of the gig that paul was doing because you know like you say he's done it for so many years or had done it for so many years super slick and people think i don't know if people think too much about it but i you know even with all the experience that you have every time you put the fader up on a mic there's a sort of a little bit of a flutter, right? And Absolutely. and in this particular context, it's not quite like saying, you know, uh, hello to everybody at a, a, a wedding that you're DJing or whatever, and, you know, <laughs> congratulations to the happy couple who's yeah. their first dance. Um, you know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of information to get out to people, and there's a very, very limited amount of time, but also a very precise amount of time, you know, when you're yeah. building up to kick off and all that, like, Again, going back to when I worked on the radio, you'd be looking at the clock and you go, right, we've got news at 12. I've got two and a half minutes of ads that I have to play before 12. I've got 20 seconds of a jingle and I've only got 31 seconds of this song left. And that leaves me with 40 seconds that I have to just, you know, fill with me waffling about something like that. But it's that precision because you have to get the news at 12. You you know, there's no question about it. So what were the impressions that you had of, of the job that Paul was doing and also the sort of the stresses of that job, I guess? 
one thing he did so good it was that it, there was no stresses the way right. the way he kind of carried himself for him it was you know water off a duck's back but by the time i had joined you know 20 he'd, he'd done a good 25 you know 26 years at least at the very least and so for him it was just a case of he did he did does radio as well so he kind of you know he sort of married the experiences together mm. and that's one thing because i remember sort of my first day with him and you look out to the crowd and there's like 60,000 of you and you're thinking I could never talk in front of <laughs> there's no way there is no way and so watching him do it the way you know he, and, he, and his trust in me to sort of be like you know are we ready to go you know am I, am I good am I good I'm like yep you are mate you're perfect don't worry mm. like you're fine and, and the fact that he still had that kind of am I good am I am I okay as well as he just took it in his stride he was so so good at it and I think he kind of just blocked people out. I think that's, I, I don't know what, 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 how else to put it, but when you, when, when I joined to see him, I, when I, sorry, when I joined and I saw him do what he's doing, this is a man who you could tell has done this for, for decades. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I was sort of amazed at how simple he made it look and it's not easy at all. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's not easy. I mean, even, um, you know, if you go to a game and you see uh, Nigel, for example, Nigel Mitchell Absolutely. doing the stuff yeah. pregame and halftime and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, he makes it look so wonderfully uh, smooth and it's anything yeah. but because, you know, there, there's such pressure on you to um, not fluff your lines, but also to deliver perhaps an important message that you might be delivering or interview somebody and occasionally there's a sort of sensitivity sometimes to those to those interviews and you're doing it in front of a stadium where let's say half the people are going for a wee or going to get a beer at halftime and the other half are sort of now checking their phones because like enough people have gone out so you can get some signal on your phone etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. you know what i mean yeah. but but you still have to be engaging to the i don't know 25 percent of people who are there and they're watching and they're listening and they're looking at you on the big screen it's yeah. it's a it's a real talent, um, I think, to be able to do that in 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 the way that these guys do it. No, absolutely, it's definitely a talent. It's not somebody that anybody can do. Uh, yeah, there's been occasions where I've had to fill in for Paul before the, you know before I was ever doing this sort of full time, and you know because he might have not been well or he couldn't make it down to the game. And I remember I think it was a game against Watford years ago, and I remember like thinking, right, Pete, you're up without any experience whatsoever. I hadn't done anything, you know, not even under 23s or anything like that. And I remember just sort of talking and I, you could hear the nervousness. You could hear mm. this kid is not out for this. You know, he's not cut out for this by any stretch. And I just remember sort of t talking back into the gallery and in my ear, like, guys, I'm struggling. This is tough. And then the same thing with Nigel. I think Nigel had to do, had to cover another place. And the person doing his job, you know, they might have been like, I think they were like content creators or something like that, that you know, influencers mm. and whatnot. And so you'd think maybe, you know, in front of camera, they're fine, they're well, until, you know, action. And when it's live, it's live. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a different ball game altogether. Like podcasting and everything else, we can edit, we can chop a few things, we can start over. When you're there live, when you're there in front of people, when you're hearing your own voice that you don't like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all of that, all of that comes into play. And so there, there's no, I cannot show my appreciation for the likes of Paul and Nigel. No, no, I can't show them enough. Uh, have you got used to your voice yet? You, you do get used to it when you hear it enough. <sighs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> to be fair, I, I have got used to it. Um, and uh, I, I guess my, my trial sort of the first year when I'd done it, I don't know if you, if we want to go into that, to that part, but like the first sort of, moment when i was actually doing the announcing was behind closed doors games so right. when there was no fans and i found that almost even worse because at mm. least with the fans i get a feedback i get some sort of you know we're all together supporting arsenal whereas when it's just your voice and the players and a couple of medical staff it's like you know who is he talking to and you're hearing everything echoey a little bit more sure you know it's very it's very awkward it's very very awkward and it almost felt like what's the point of me being here well yeah like, yeah that nobody nobody needs to be here right so tell me about the first one then like what's you know what, what was the first one can you remember and you know what were what were the nerves like going in knowing that you were uh whether it was your full time or or filling in for paul like you yeah. know, it, it, it is a big responsibility. It's like being the nighttime DJ and then they tell you, uh, tomorrow you need to do the breakfast show. It's like, exactly. oh, fuck. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 like you know, one of them was definitely when Paul was not well, and it was like twenty. I want to say this is about twenty sixteen seventeen season. Mm-hmm. We played Watford, and yeah, as I said, I, I I spoke to the guys in in the gallery. I said, look, guys, I'm struggling with this. You could just hear the nervousness in my voice. I was trembling and everything else. It was it was a horrific experience. Let me put it that way. Um, in terms of the pandemic, I'm trying to remember even what our first game was. I can only remember the first away game when we played Man City, but. After the lockdown, the first home game, whatever it was, I've got maybe Norwich in my head, but I don't think that's even. I'll even check close while you're talking record. here. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, I just remember kind of it was little things like you know the players would come out to warm up, and you would normally have to announce them warming up, mm. and that was normally to be announced to the crowd, like yeah. you know, for the first time this this evening or this afternoon, please welcome the Arsenal. But then instead, sure. it was me because just saying it to nobody. But I think the team wanted it to be as close to a match day experience as possible. It was so not, you know, nothing, no, don't, don't act like this is different. Right. You need to act like it's the same. The three points are still the same. The league is still the same. The matches still matter. So that was very, very weird. And, you know, with the whole COVID time and everybody's in two meter distance, it was weird. Cause even in the position I was working in, I'm not near anybody. So just, <laughs> just little things like that. And you think, but, you know, all the yeah. COVID testing and all that. It was just really, it was just a bizarre, bizarre way. That's what you call the deep end. For yeah, sure. for sure. It was Brighton actually at home. Oh, no, it wasn't. Brighton. It wasn't. It was Norwich. You're right, because we had three away games. It was Norwich. Yeah. The first home game was a 4 0 win over Norwich. Right. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, that is, it was such a surreal time anyway. Absolutely. To, to, to do something like that is kind of surreal as it is because you're announcing to to nobody uh, because there's nobody not even really aware of the buildup of the game because even when the, the, the coverage came on TV, we get like, you know, uh, the, the little bit before kickoff, but then we don't get all the, the Arsenal coming out to warm up and all that kind of stuff. So, no. yeah, that must have been really weird. But I guess it's, it's sort of, in a way, it gives you a chance to... Uh, overcome a few obstacles and nerves and what have you. So what was it like then when fans were back? What was it like the first time? And I don't mean the time we had like 2,000 fans. I (laughs) mean, when we had like all the fans... Yeah. Did it feel? Did you feel more comfortable doing it then, or was it still like, ah, okay, now this is different? Yeah, it, it felt different. It felt different. I mean, that, those two thousand that you're talking about. I think we played like Rapid Vienna, one of them, and yeah. then I think it was Brighton and the last home game of the season. I think we had like ten thousand in, and that ten thousand was a little bit more, you know, a bit, bit more of a thing. And then, then we had the Mind Series. I don't know if you remember. There was like a Mind Series thing. It kind of replaced the Emirates Cup mm. that season, uh, and it had Spurs and Chelsea in it. Yes, and I think our one was Chelsea at home. I think we played Spurs away, but we had Chelsea at home. And then that was more like, I think that was, a, I can't remember if that was like a fully packed stadium, but the first Premier League was Chelsea at home when they, when they'd beaten us 2-0. Mm. Um, that was, that was crazy. That was crazy, crazy, crazy. But I don't, I don't know if you remember the story with like Bakayo Saka, Rashford and Sancho had gone through what they went through with England. Oh, the and yeah, the was, Euros. Yeah. It was Saka's first game at the Emirates since then. And I just remember like with, with myself being nervous and everything else, I remember when I announced his name and I kind of held on to his first name a bit longer than I normally would just because I like I wanted him to feel like, hey, man, we're still we're behind you regardless yeah. of what happened in the summer and everything else. And, you know, he went through that whole thing where he had like a lot of messages on the wall and stuff like that. But I remember sort of announcing his name and the crowd absolutely like lost it. And it was like, this is amazing. This is incredible. And from then I was like, you know what? The buzz is here. I've now got I've got I've got the buzz now. And it's like it's a drug that I can't I can't lose. Sure. What what I find harder is more so the housekeeping rules. You know, like welcome to the Emirates Stadium. You know, mm-hmm. please be reminded it's a non-smoking stadium. All of that jazz is the sure. thing that I find a bit more nerve-wracking. And let's say you know Maradona passes away, doing a little bit before kickoff for him, stuff like that. Those are the bits that are very very nerve-wracking. Whereas the players, 
that's the fun bit. Yeah, and sure. The goals is the fun part. So yeah, it's pure go, ecstasy and, you know, yeah. You, you can riff a bit, you know, obviously depending on the exactly. mood and, and the, you, you talk about the start of that season when you went in and fans were back. That was a really difficult start to the season because yeah. of uh, the results that we had and everything else. And obviously things have, have got better since then, thankfully. But yeah, I mean, when, when, for, when you do something like that with the Maradona, is that something you have to script yourself or do you are you handed a script or is that something you'd work on collaboratively uh, within yeah, so- the team yeah no more often than not it's it's given to me from like our communications side of things mm-hmm. just so that they've got i guess they want to cross every you know t and dot every i i've always whenever i see somebody in the football sphere that's passed away i always know right there's something coming for for them mm. and I'll, I'll write something down or i'll make sure i have some notes that are like key and important just in case somebody forgets because at the end of the day, it's my responsibility to have that done. And I sure. shouldn't necessarily have to fall back on, oh, guys, give me a script, like kind of thing. It's more often than not, I would write a lot of stuff on my own. But in terms of those kind of poignant things, always leave it with the comms team. Because sure. at least it's the same message that Arsenal will be putting out across the board. For and sure. that's the whole point. So look, talk me through, if there is such a thing as a typical match day, okay. because I'm pretty sure every experience is different. And, you know, like you say, the... You know, the mood can be affected by what happened in the previous game, the result of the previous game. But let's imagine it's a nice sunny day. It's a 3 p.m. kickoff at the Emirates. Um, we're all looking forward to the game. What what does your day look like? What time do you get to the stadium? What are the things that you have to go through, um, you know, in order to to get yourself ready for, for kickoff um, yeah. and for, you know, for what you've got to do and what you've got to, to bring to the experience for Arsenal fans, because I think that's, you know, it is part of it. You know, they're they're there to see the football, but you're also part of the colour of the event. You know what I mean? So talk me through a day. So, okay. So funny enough, I've got two jobs at Arsenal. So I have a Monday to Friday job at Arsenal where I work for stadium management department. And so we're there throughout the week. And even on a match day, typically... If you were just an announcer, you would probably arrive four hours before kickoff. Mm -hmm. So say for a three o'clock, 11 o'clock is usually the time you would start. But I'm usually there a lot earlier because I'm dealing with other things that are also geared up for the match day. Okay. Um, It's admin stuff. It's nothing like, you know, nothing exciting as such. Um, So let's say typically, you know, 11 o'clock, I'll get into my booth to get kind of ready for what we call a fax check and, you know, make sure we test all the sound and test all the big screens, make sure the mics are all good. Music is working. Everything's fine. Uh, but, you know, my, I use my laptop and I've got CDs just as backup, just in case. Um, and we will run through like the Premier League anthem or whatever the competition we're in. Thankfully, the Champions League will be this season. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be running, I'll be dusting off the dust on that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we'll typically just be running and then Nigel will be there on pitch side because mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're sort of, we work together. So we'll be testing our mics and so on. That's about three hours before kickoff. Um, at about, let's say, so that's four hours before kickoff. So about, let's say, two and a half hours before kickoff, just before the stadium's about to open, uh, we will go down to a the press sort of conference area and have a meeting with all the kind of different people involved because there's an entire like gallery department that sort of run the big screens. You've got Nigel, you've got myself, you've got cameras, you've got uh, all sorts of runners, it's quite a few of us there yeah. on the day. Um, and so we will have like a draft of what the match day show will look like. And the match day show is typically one hour before kickoff. So we would have our little meeting of like 15, 20 minutes, run through the running order, you know, cross anything. And and the comms team will kind of be there sometimes as well, just to make sure like, is everything fine? Mm-hmm. Is everything good to go? Um, and then we'll have a bit of lunch or di- you know dinner, depending on the time. Uh, we'll have a bit of lunch and then we'll head back to our respective positions. So Nigel will go pitch side. The gallery team will go back to the gallery. I'll head up to the booth. And um, an hour before kickoff, the match day show begins. Um, and so once that's gone on for an hour, you know, advert runs, Nigel's talking, mm. I'm talking, you know, the, the the players are training and there's competitions, there's games, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then, it, then it, before you know it, it's kind of this kickoff already. So you're leading up to kickoff. And as soon as the Arsenal come out, then it's then it's game on. Um, and then, you know, halftime, we will have uh, we'll have like uh, dedications and shout outs that will be given. Um, and I usually typically get those from like the community department because I think mm-hmm. people like donate money to the foundation and then they can get something read out. Um, we'll have like halftime scores. There'll be junior gunner penalties. There'll be all kinds of activity going on. Um, 
I'm sure when you've seen last, you know, pitch side is absolutely heaving when it comes to sure. pre-match and in at half time. Um, and then, yeah, so the second half will come back into play and then, you know, obviously the goals and hopefully we win. And then post-match, just a few more advert runs and uh, basically good night or, you know, safe journeys home. So Full-time that's scores. And, and, and I'll probably leave uh, maybe after the, after the stadium's closed. So just in case for any emergency announcements, because the main role for the announcer really is for emergency PA. With everything that's kind of happened since Hillsborough, it, it then became a thing of an emer- emergency announcer has to be in place for a game to go ahead. Right. So that's, that's primarily the main reason you're there then everything else falls after. Wow. I mean, I never, I mean, it's obvious when you say it, but I, you know, I hadn't considered that as part of, yeah. of the, the, the key part of, of your remit, you know? Oh God, yeah. What about the, the, the timing of anthems, Premier League music, um, yeah. you know, uh, the Come On You Gunners, uh, North London Forever, all of that kind of stuff. Is that like to the second on the clock? So, you know, you've Absolutely. you've obviously got uh, a voice in your ear telling you sixty seconds. Um, yeah. You know, this is you know sixty seconds to kick off because kickoff has to be you know timed with the broadcasters and and right. coordinated all that kind of stuff. Does that get yeah. stressful at all, or is that just you know once you get used it, to it? Do you know what? It, it, where it gets stressful is when the players don't behave and they're not on time for stuff. That's usually <laughs> you know if you're on Sky or BT and um, you know the players have to walk at a certain time. They mm. they've got to take you know they've got to take the knee at a certain time or they've got to stand around in a circle at a certain time. You know when it's Remembrance Sunday and things like that, it's very 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 delicate. And so it's usually those moments where it becomes a little bit more trickier. Yeah. Um, those are the stressful ones when you've got to do, you know, we might have a light show, so we're going to have a light show and then we have to press the anthem and then the, you know, whatever music it is that's next and right here, right now for the team announcement, it's, it can be chaotic, mm-hmm. but it's always down to the, it, it, what makes it more chaotic is if somebody has not, sort of done their bit on the on the right on the time and nine times out of ten it's the players Mikel's giving them the last sort of encouragement before they leave and whatever the case may be it must be that so yeah we usually it's the players waiting in the tunnel that kind of thing sure okay yeah stuff that's out of your control yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah yeah of course Every, everything else is kind of it's quite I've got so used to it it's kind of second nature I know how the rhythm goes from from sort of the you wrote uh, the Premier League anthem to right here right now announce the team's to you know announcing the officials and then it's north london forever and then it's kickoff yeah like it's quite seamless that way yeah yeah no it always it always sounds uh it always sounds amazing and it must be you know taking last season for example as an arsenal fan doing the doing the work that you do sort of i don't want to say this doesn't sound i don't want this to sound bad but sort of riding the crest of the wave that the you know that that everyone experienced because of how the team was uh, performing because of how the fans were in the stadium because of the mood of everybody it must have been so much fun to sort of to to just be part of those games and part of that experience because you know there are times obviously when you have to announce things that that aren't good um but for the most part this season at home anyway you know the 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 mood has been so so much fun i mean was did it bring a different dimension to it were there things you could do um with your with your work with your voice with how you said a player's name with how you said an opposition player's name whatever it might be being yeah. respectful of course but yeah, you know yeah. were those things <laughs> were the, were those things part of 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 last season for you yeah de- definitely i think it's, it, i'm so fortunate to be at this point where you know the mood is so much better than what it was and had had and it's it's funny you know paul Paul's always used to still kind of ride the wave regardless of how the team was doing, you know, and mm. he, he, he sort of knew how to, I don't know what the word is, but like kind of marry, he read the room well, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and not necessarily in a sense of like, you know, if everyone's feeling down, he feels down too, but he doesn't go overboard where it's almost coming across patronizing in a way. Sure. So you, you kind of, you kind of meet where you meet with it. I mean, I look at like Granite Xhaka, for example, you think, how, I never thought in a million years, like now I could say his name, hold the first name for a long period of time. The crowd are singing his name. We're playing, you know, glad all over after games mm. because the crowd have been singing it all day. You know, you get away with like, for example, songs to, to players chance, like sure. that kind of thing was a thing that kind of 
got birthed out because it was like, my God, if I don't play tequila, I mean, that must be, I must be <laughs> mad. Do you know what I mean? I will yeah. deal with the problem later. If it's, if the, if, if the powers that be have, have a problem with this, I, I don't mind. We'll take the bullet on it for this one, but they will see that. My God, look at them. They are going mental. So I remember that. Good, I remember that. Yeah. In uh, after yeah, yeah. the, um, after the North London Derby this season, when we yeah. when we hammered Spurs and and they you know oh, waved yeah. waved the white flag of surrender halfway <laughs> through the second half, but I do yeah. remember distinctly like you played tequila, you played um, glad all over, uh, yeah. and you know people were in the stadium 10, 15, 20 minutes after the game had yeah. ended, just because the atmosphere was so amazing. Yeah, nobody wanted to leave. And you know, you know what? You know, Arsenal games back in the, back in the day, a couple of years ago. You know, 80th minute, people were trying to make sure they beat the train. Mm. They're trying to make sure they get out of there quickly as possible. And it's so funny the amount of times we stood back. I mean, you know, Bournemouth away. Uh, sorry, Bournemouth at home after Reese Nelson's goal. You know, post match, I was playing music for a good 15, 20 minutes just because it was the feel good factor. You know, Sweet Caroline kind of came back, and it was it was all a bit you know, crazy mm. and mental. And, you know, when you, when, and that's, that's kind of the fun thing with the job. People always ask me if I got a playlist ready and it's like, there's one on standby if I need to, but I, you have to go with what they're doing. You sure. have to go with what the crowd are doing. And then that's what makes it, you know, it's what makes it better. It, when you're a DJ as well, you play to the crowd. But that's exactly so, it. That's exactly yeah. it. You're right. And you've, you've done it amazingly well this season. But what about, um, what about some of the, I mean, I remember Saliba actually dancing down the tunnel uh, that day, yeah. you know. So if you can get Saliba dancing, you're fucking doing. That would be well. That would you're, be well. You're doing good work on the decks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Talk to me about some of the halftime music choices or I, I, yeah. listen, I'm not a wrestling guy, but I see people talk about it all the time is yeah. like, oh, they're playing. I can't remember the name of any single wrestler apart from, you know, <laughs> Macho Man, Randy Savage. And it's not that right. era of wrestling. But, um, yeah. you know, how deliberate was that? You're obviously a fan. So what was the thinking there? So, yeah, I grew up watching wrestling since, since you know, even Savage, those Randy Savage yeah. days. Like, I've grown up watching wrestling for a long time. And when it comes to sort of playing the music, one of, like, in my interview, it was like, what kind of music would you play at a football stadium? And mm. it was like, you know, you kind of want to play a few things that are a bit, not me, Mellow, but at the beginning, it's like you're easing people in. They've just come into the stadium. It's probably an hour and a half before kickoff. Mm -hmm. When it gets closer to kickoff, what kind of, you know, how are you going to ramp up the crowd a little bit? It's a bit more rock. It's a bit more heavy. It's a bit more like pumping music, fist sure. pumping kind of come on type of thing. And um, I remember just sort of like you, you keep playing, you keep playing sort of the same old stuff. And sometimes you want to just add a few new things here and there. Sure. And one of the things I loved about like wrestling and especially entrance music is like some of that stuff you can get away playing anywhere. You know, I play it in the gym or I'll play it, you know, wherever else. And it always felt cool. And there was a trip. There's a there's a wrestler, you know, Triple H, who had a song which was from Motorhead. So Motorhead is, is so I could kind of hide behind the fact that no 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 this is a Motorhead song it's not a wrestling <laughs> song let's see how it goes and so I had been playing that actually for quite some time in in all honesty I've been playing it for quite a few years but it was the pandemic where it stuck because no crowd so on TV you heard heard everything quite clearly yeah, via yeah, the yeah. television so that's what kind of and and you know people were like oh my god look Arsenal started doing this I've been doing this for years like since I joined there so it's just one of those because you had no choice but to hear what was being played when the players came out and there's not you can hear a pin drop so obviously the music was very very loud on the TV and then that's when it all the euphoria just came and I was like uh oh what's happened here and Arsenal were like mate if it works if it works carry on like you know if the people like it and they and they seem to you you'll obviously get those people who are like man what the hell is this right sure and, and, and there's sixty thousand of you I'm not going to please sixty thousand that's for sure there are generations but, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <yeah. laughs> I, and that's the thing I cover every single blade of grass when it comes to the music on a match day so you will hear things from it, it can go from anywhere left to right I play everything sure. every genre nothing is missed out. Now, do you uh, do you try and uh, you know squeeze in a few Arsenal fans? Uh, who make music in there a little bit more. I remember uh, for the final game of the season, I did hear quite a bit of Dua Lipa in there. Yeah, of course. You know, you always, <laughs> you always try to, you always try to, you know, especially what you kind of 
want to do more so is avoid ones that are Spurs fans or Chelsea fans or whatever. Very so good. So you, kind of, you yeah. kind of avoid them. And then it's like, okay, so what are, we, what are we playing with here? If I know of any that are well-known Arsenal fans, then it's like, great, we can play that. And then it's a case of like, who who have I heard say, the, oh yeah, I support Arsenal. And then, sure. you know, a bit more of their music comes in. So there is a bit of that that comes into, comes into play with that. All right. And do you, I mean, is that something that week to week you, you give a, like some thought to or is it a case that right okay this has happened and you know obviously as uh, somebody with a dj background your knowledge of music would be extensive enough anyway yeah. um the way it works these days you can just get a song in an instant yeah. um you're not like like oh, i'm gonna sound like such an old cunt but like <laughs> walk, walking after gigs with like, like bags of 12 inch records trying to find a taxi couldn't find one anywhere and now all you need is literally a laptop or a, an ipad or something like that and you can you can just pull up the music so is it yeah. sort of about reacting to what's going on and then just figuring out okay yeah i know i can pull this one here yeah, so th th there's definitely stuff I have that's safe where I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, if all, all all else fails, I can lean on this kind of music. And then, yeah, as the games go on, like I remember doing that Saliba one on on the spot in the sense of I got the song and kind of sort of downloaded it just as during the game. I downloaded it and I started to clip just the just that chorus bit because I know the first sure. time I'd done it, um, it, it kind of played the long version. And so fans were kind of like, is this the bit where we can, yeah. is this the, whoa, <laughs> they weren't really sure. Yeah, yeah. So then I made up, I've made like a clip of it. And sometimes in game, I'll just sort of think, okay, they're all heading in this direction. I'm hearing what they're, the fans, what they're singing a lot. I go to away games when I can. Yeah. Um, if I if I can get tickets, I mean, you know, like an Arsenal ticket this season has been like gold dust. Sure. So, getting an away ticket and I'm there just sitting in there soaking in everything. I'm, I've got my work hat on and I've got my fan hat on. So, sure. you know, I'll just, like I was at the Forest game, you know, unfortunately the result, but like it was an, it was like an, it was like a party before kickoff, you know, before yeah. kickoff in the game, it was what it was. And then, you know, the, the, the crowd, you can hear how the Forest fans kind of connected with their announcer and with their DJ and, and with the players. And so it was like, yeah, it's very much a case of you, you got to have, be flexible. You've got to be able to, be able to just sort of find something there and then and i treat sort of early kickoffs late kickoffs i kind of treat them kind of differently i was gonna ask, night yeah. Game, yeah yeah because if there's a night game you get you can get away with a few more kind of club anthems you can get away with a bit more even sometimes some 80s classics i remember playing like all night long by lionel richie and it, it and, the, and the crowd were doing their thing i can love like, that oh, sweet, okay they're having <laughs> and even like you know carabao cup games they're different to the premier league because the carabao cup are for people that don't normally come to games it's like 10 20 quid a ticket so you get a lot of kids coming in from north london they're sure. all in there and so you're playing a little bit more of that kind of whether it's trap or hip-hop grime whatever the case may be you, you kind of cater yeah, to yeah. that and and they're there thinking man arsenal's like proper modern but it's it's always been the kind of the forward club to me even as a fan yeah yeah just like you know so um, like yeah, you say yeah, yeah you're, you you play to the crowd and uh exactly. the crowd changes you know week by week and time by time yeah i was going to ask that about whether there, there's a difference between some of the kickoff times and, and all the rest well look yeah. you, you're doing amazing work um and it's it's Thank been you. brilliant to to talk to you what are your what are your hopes for the summer and what are your hopes for next season obviously it's been such a you know in the the dust has settled now. I think it was a really enjoyable season, all things considered. Um, it does feel like, you know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, it does feel like as a club, we're sort of going in a particular direction. And I don't know if you guys feel that internally as well. I don't know how you wouldn't, you know, from top yeah. to bottom. I don't know how people wouldn't feel that, but it must be exciting. You know, everyone's looking, I'm sure looking forward to having a bit of a break, bit of a holiday, all the rest of it, and then come back and, and do more and do bigger and do better next season. Absolutely. It's been one hell of a season. I mean, it's been one of, it's the longest season we've ever had, right? Especially with the World Cup kind of plunked in the middle. Mm. And even then we had women's games, you know, so Arsenal women would play. Uh, we even had like the Rugby World Cup. We had that at the Emirates. Sure. Um, we've got the Arctic Monkeys in concert. So it's, the, the, the work is still flat out even throughout the summer. Um, but yeah, the, the buzz is back. The, the truth of the matter is the buzz is back. And I know like, just even from the Emirates Cup this season gone, because of our preseason was so good, because the signings were made early, mm. we were beating Chelsea in, in, in Florida and wherever else we were playing in the States. Then when it came to the Emirates Cup, we given Sevilla, I think like six, and it was, you know, Jesus' debut at home and yeah. people were just excited to see him. And we, we absolutely slaughtered Sevilla. And you could just feel like, hmm, there's something else going on. 
And when the first game of the season kicked off against Palace, it was like, whoa, who is this Arsenal team? Who are they? Because they, they were, we were on fire yeah. opening day of the season. And I just think that that's the kind of, we're on that wave. I know people make noise about, you know, Arsenal had their chance this year to, to really do it. You know, everyone's going to be back next year, your Liverpools and so on and so forth. And it's like, well, we're going to be okay. We're going to be better as well. Sure. You know? I'm, I'm expecting, like, you know, the, the summer will be good. I think there will be surprise. Arsenal like to surprise us every now and again. They always pull out something. And I think there might be something there. And, yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic of the season. Champions League football is back, if anything. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be amazing. Just get get your seatbelt on. It'll be another roller coaster ride. All right. And you, my friend, are the uh, the voice of it when we're playing at home. And uh, yeah. it's look, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. And uh, keep up the great work. It's been an absolute pleasure to be on as well. Thank you for having me and uh, up the Arsenal. My thanks to Peter, a familiar voice to many of you, but in a very different context, of course. You hear him read out the team names, uh, announce the Arsenal onto the pitch, announce the goal scorers. Like, for example, you know, when Bakayo Saka scores the fourth goal against Tottenham in our win against them this coming September. I'm pretty sure Peter will uh, will have some fun with that. If you want to follow him on Twitter, you can do that. He is at Peter on sports at Peter on sports. If you're looking for something else to listen to that isn't the transfer window mayhem, you can check out a, an episode of Waffle over on Patreon. That is a podcast in which James and I talk about anything and everything except Arsenal. Among the topics in this particular episode, we have a man who ate a tea bag for no good reason at all. James's letter to Jason Sudeikis, he of Ted Lasso fame, uh, zombies versus dinosaurs, vocal exercises, and lots more. You can get that right now over on Patreon if you want to sign up. It's patreon.com forward slash arsebog. If you're already a member, thank you very much indeed. That podcast is there waiting for you right now. So we're going to leave it there for this particular show. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, as always, for being here. Try and stay cool, calm, a little bit zen as things do or don't happen over the weekend. None of it is in our control anyway, so we're just going to have to wait and see how it all plays out. We'll have an Arsecast Extra for you on Monday. Please do join us for that. In the meantime, have a great weekend, and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye. Join us as we take another enchanting adventure into the world of the angriest man on Twitter. Oi, Edo! We have a lot of business to do this summer, so it's extremely important that we look after the money that we have to spend and we do not waste it in any way at all. Ah, Edo! Why did you not give every single penny that the club has got so we could secure the signing of Declan Rice immediately? By trying to negotiate, you've shown that you can't negotiate! Get a new mortgage on the stadium! Sell your bloody kidneys for all I care! Just get this deal done! Yesterday! Next week, another madcap laugh-a-minute romp with the angriest man on Twitter. Everything is shit!